Hello everyone and welcome to this week's episode of the One Puck Short Podcast. I'm your host Rob McGregor. Joining me on this week's show is New York Times writer Pat Pickens here to discuss the Rangers, Islanders and Devils seasons so far, plus a chance for you to win a copy of Eastside Hockey Manager. So without further ado, let's get this show on the road. Five, four, three, two, one. Puck Short. Joining me now on the One Puck Short podcast, a writer for the New York Times, USA Today and NHL.com, plus a friend of the show, please welcome back Mr. Pat Pickens. Hi Pat, how are you? I'm well, Rob. How's it going? I'm good. Thanks for joining me again. I think we, we last sure. spoke just as the postseason was was starting last year uh, and looked at a few of the matchups there and the Rangers was one of them uh, and that's where I'd like to start today really because they've had an interesting start to the year. I think you could be described as decent but Henrik Lundqvist absolutely stellar play maybe papered over a few cracks for the Rangers who've stumbled a little more recently mm-hmm. yeah I would say um, I, I wrote and I, I refer to it as a mirage in a story a couple weeks back <laughs> uh, uh, just because Lundqvist has been so great yeah. and um, and what's interesting about that is he and Auntie Ranta have both been great but they've both I mean it, it's hard to to say that a 938 save percentage could they could be in a bit of a slump <laughs> but um Longquist was in the you know the low 950s mm. and Rosa was in the mid 950s um just 2 weeks ago yeah and now all of a sudden after you know uh, uh, they both have dipped a little bit but the team you know is kind of in a in a in a rough stretch here of late mm. um they now granted they had a uh, a Resurgent performance against Ottawa mm-hmm. on Sunday, which was which was, you know, the Senators aren't great defensively, but it was <laughs> it, it was nice to see the Rangers kind of you know rally and, and look like themselves again, yeah, a little bit, especially after the week they had. They were one four and one in a six game stretch. They lost to Colorado. They lost the shootout game to the Islanders on rivalry night last week, which mm. was a fantastic game. But they were drastically out. They've been drastically outplayed for a lot of the season this year. Um, but like you said, Lundqvist has kind of kept them in it. I mean, if you see some of the saves she's made, they they're they're pretty unbelievable. They've already gotten caught by the Washington Capitals after this kind of dip in play here. Mm. Uh, it feels like they're still a playoff team, but um, they're going to have to find some of their game here a little bit over the next. But basically, I want to see it over the next month, really. Yeah. I think most people would have them in the top three in that metropolitan division. I think they're mm-hmm. they've got enough depth there. Henrik Lundqvist is such a massive factor for them because he's consistently been so good. Anti Ranta has proved that he can also give them good goaltending. So they're not solely reliant on Lundqvist. I think that was one of the advantages they had last year was that Cam Talbot stepped yeah. up when he did, and so Lundqvist got some mm-hmm. some proper rest, which he hadn't really had for a long time. Uh, but yeah. There are issues, I, th- I think, there. as I said, most people would put them in the playoffs and they're kind of one of these teams now which is at a point where it's all about what they do in the playoffs because it's kind of a yeah. given that they will make the cut and they will be in the top eight and they will be there in the spring. But again, to me, watching the Rangers, some of the old issues from last season are still there. It's the mobility at the back end and particularly a couple of weeks ago when they played Montreal, that big... Uh, really, the, the, the two divisional leaders at the time going head to head. I mean, I tuned in late. I caught the, the last five minutes of the second when it was pretty much all Rangers from what I saw. They had, they controlled the puck beautifully, just couldn't find a way through. Uh, and then yeah. the Canadians just ran mm-hmm. over them in the third period. They just couldn't match yeah. the, the Montreal speed. And, and that really stood out, especially at the back end. It's strange because the Rangers are, have universally been considered probably the fastest team in the sport, basically the last three or four years. And, you know, from, from my own perspective, you know, they traded Carl Hagelin mm. in the off season at, uh, at the draft. And I thought that was a pretty good move to get Emerson Edom because Edom's kind of that power forward type. He, he plays with some speed, but he mm-hmm. plays bigger. He plays more of an offensive game than Hagelin. Hagelin scored 17 goals last year, but he's not really an off. I mean, you've kind of seen it in Anaheim. He's not really an offensive player. No. By the, you know, for an office first player, and he's more of that. And yet, for some reason, they haven't found a spot for Edom 
to play more than 10 games in the lineup. He doesn't have a goal yet. Mm. And it's really one of those weird things that that deal looks really bad right now for the Rangers. But I, I, I like Adam. It just feels like his usage has been wrong. And, and there's still, Chris Kreider has come under a lot of fire lately. It's one of yeah. those things where it seems like he's like Nash in a lot of ways, where when he's on, he can take over games, he can dominate. He's got that power, that same speed, power forward move. Mm-hmm. I think Nash obviously plays more of a two-way game. But Kreider has been largely absent this season. And you wonder what the story with that is. I mean, I don't know whether it's a guy who likes Maybe loves being in New York a little bit more than you know than to, the discipline to put it all together <laughs> on the ice while he's because you know he lo- you know he's a young guy yeah and he's, he's he lives in New York City and you know there's a lot of you know, things that that can distract from mm. from a young player like that and he, he's only 12 points in 28 games everyone's kind of waiting for that big breakout Nash style year and it just hasn't come yet and you wonder if it ever is going to come. Yeah. Uh, Is that maybe a part of the problem that some of the streaky guys, because regardless of his previous totals, Rick Nash has always kind of been a streaky goal scorer. A lot of goal scorers are. Mm. Phil Kessel's another good example of a guy who will score a lot of goals, but he will have periods where he maybe only gets one goal in five, six, seven games, and then he'll score five goals in the next three and everything will be good again. Yeah. Is that kind of what's yeah. going on maybe with Kreider? He, he's got, like you said, that comparison to Rick Nash isn't just physical. It's also maybe between the ears a little bit where he had the, has these funks and then he'll just break out and he'll score five goals in the next three, four games and ev- all the problems will be forgotten. You think so. You would, you know, you'd get that vibe because, you know, he, it's interesting though because his, his, uh, his goal totals have improved every season, but there is something obviously there between the ears because, at first, you know, he came in in that 2012 playoff year, mm-hmm. and he had five goals in 18 games, and he was dominant and kind of was, it was a difference maker for them in that, that playoff front of the Eastern Conference Final. But they, you know, um, they, he didn't play a lot of the, the lockout season, spent a lot of it in, in the AHL, which is understandable, young player. Yeah. But then when Elaine Vigno took over that first year, he started the season in Hartford, and of the American League. He, put, he only stayed six games, but he didn't make the team. So there's definitely something. Vigno has been trying to push the button with Kreider before. There's mm. no doubt. He's alluded to it. He said he likes Kreider. I mean, he loves Kreider as a player. Yeah. You know, what's not to love? He's a, he's a big body. He's a huge speed. And he's a great talent. I, I also think, you know, not having Derek Stepan might be affecting him a little bit. Mm. But, I mean, this is a guy who scored 21 goals last year who had 46 points last year, who was a plus 24 player last year. And uh, you just you watch him or you watch the Rangers and he's largely absent. And you, you just you just wonder maybe I mean, whether there's an injury. What, like I said, maybe there's something distracting going on with him. But it, it's a strange dynamic that, you know, Nash, for an for a extended period of time that, that – for a couple of weeks, he kind of dominated, took over, yeah. and I think he scored six goals, in the, including he had a hat trick in Florida. So, um, and, and other than that, he's been largely absent this season too. Um, and you wonder just what the story is, or what's going on there a little bit. I, I, I'm going to keep my eye on him over the next, like I said, maybe a few weeks, just to see if he comes around mm. um, until Derek Stepan gets back, because you know that's a guy who, who kind of needs to. You know, he, he's a big part. He's, a, he's a, their second line left winger, and you know he has um, four goals this season. And you know he only has two points in the last five games, and he's been largely absent. Mm-hmm. And, and it's more—it's not—it's more than just scoring. You know, he's not generating shots. He's not getting to the front of the net. He's not. I mean, when, when he's going right, those are the things he's doing. And he's just—he's not doing. He, he's playing that game. That's, that's like I said is largely absent, and uh, and the Rangers need more than, from him. Yeah, for sure. I, they, sorry, go ahead, Pat. I'm sorry, I was going to say, and they, they need, you mentioned the blue line, too. They need more of their defense also. You know, it's weird to say that Dan Girardi has been one of their offensive, better offensive players this <laughs> season, but, um, but you know, there, there's just, it's an old, aging, overpaid blue line. We kind of all thought that was coming, 
at some point because you're already just signed a huge deal. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I mean, you you know as well as I do that that you know it's not a great defensive group, and it's 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 a group that gets that has gotten very overrated over the last few years just because Ryan McDonough is a superstar. Yeah. But the rest yeah. of the talent are, and Yandel's good at you know more of the offensive guy as opposed to McDonough who's the two way guy. But there's a steep drop off there, and you know Girardi's struggles are obvious. But you know, so are you know if you watch closely, Mark Stahl is struggling. Oh, Dan uh, yeah. Boyle has been in and out of the lineup. Uh, you know they dealt with some injuries with Kevin Klein here, and um, and and you know you said it, Lundqvist is masking a lot of those those mistakes by especially you know in coverage and in um, you know slow footedness from their mm. blue line. Yeah, I mean, Girardi is a guy who, he comes into fire a lot, and I understand why. I had, I say, an argument or a debate with, with some Rangers fans about Girardi, and, uh, you know, I, I don't see him as a top four NHL defenseman anymore. Uh, and it just the, the the foot speed isn't there. And I know, as oh. we said last season, when we spoke just before the playoffs, he was one guy that we questioned whether he would be able to cope with guys like Ovechkin charging at him in that series. And it's, yeah. it's only getting worse. And I know kind of the defense put out was, well, you know, he was hurt, he had surgery. But, I mean, the, the numbers have been... Uh, people, or Some Rangers fans seem to think this is like a concentrated campaign by a small handful of journalists going after Girardi, when it's really not. Like, mm-hmm. The... the Eye test isn't great if you put stock in that. The advanced yeah. stats aren't great if you put stock in that. So he's not really winning on either front, uh, and he's getting paid I think, all this money. I was going to say, I think the 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 reason he gets a break is because he's such a stand up guy in their room. Yeah, and you oh, know yeah, he'll yeah. he'll answer he'll answer every question you pose at him. He'll answer it honestly. You know, you, you a lot of guys get chided for. Speaking in cliches, but Dan Girardi is probably one of the more honest player, honest um, yeah, talkers, but, uh, and more accountable people in the Rangers room. I would say for sure, I can understand that point. But at what point do you? Yeah, you know, what, at what point does being a good guy not cut it anymore? Because I'm not, yeah, you know, sure. everything I've ever seen of Girardi, I would agree. You know, he comes across, he came across really well during that that series of twenty four seven. You know, everybody loved his kid. This is a hockey prodigy at like three years old, uh, mm-hmm. and you know, he was yeah. sort of one of the stars of that particular series because of his honesty and his likability. But at the end of the day, you know, being a nice guy doesn't keep the puck out of your net or put the puck in. It's true. You know, and as you said, Mark Stahl's really, really strong. I. I uh, going back a couple of weeks against Florida, he got absolutely burned by one of the Panthers' wingers. And it, what should have been a pretty simple chase for Stahl just to, to get back, click the puck, and you know start a breakout, he got beaten to the puck in a situation that he mm-hmm. never... It, an NHL defenseman should never get beaten to the puck in. And, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, Boyle, Boyle's pretty much there as a special a power play guy. It's just difficult because, as you said, I totally agree. McDonough is a stud defenseman in the NHL, but he's kind of getting dragged down by some of these other guys, and that's becoming a problem. Yeah. And the Rangers just yeah. don't have the cap to really make a serious move. They've got one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in cap space. Yeah, yeah, and they have they have, they do have a couple of youngsters in there. I mean, you saw Dylan McElrath's been called up. Mm. I, my guess is that Dylan McElrath's probably going to end up being the guy to play with McDonough at some point. Um, I don't know whether it's fair to put that on him this year or whether it's next year. I mean, he's a restricted at the end of uh, next year. Um, they just, the, the, every Ranger fan who I talk to about it brings it up, and it was just a bad decision to not, to, to let uh, Anton Strollman walk. And you can't, as Brez, <laughs> you can't look back <laughs> at things like that. Yeah. You can't, I mean, obviously things don't change. Is not you know looking back and saying oh we should have done that is not going to change anything mm. now, but it's just it's becoming patently obvious. It feels like Girardi might be a buyout candidate. Well, if not after this year, then maybe after next. Uh, the other the other kind of uh, loophole could be, and I don't know how much you followed this, mm. is this whole notion of the uh, the expansion draft. Yeah, in the next mm. couple of years here. I mean, I guess that came out yesterday a little bit. Sure, but yeah. um, you know, if you can save the money and, and save the cap hit until that happens, you know, you could bury him on your third pair, 
and and maybe get that break out of it. But I mean, the, 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 um, it's becoming clear that that the Rangers' defense is not particularly stellar this season, and they've really gotten offense from only a few guys. You know, Zuccarello and Lindbergh and, and Nash carried them for an extended period of time. It's really remarkable that they were in second place in the Metro and really, you know, near the top of the standings yeah. in the whole East, just based on how, how mediocre they've been in this, uh, in this first stretch here. Mm. Yeah. I mean, they, they got, they found a way to win uh, early on. And mm-hmm. as you said, they're third in the Eastern conference, 12, four and one at home. That doesn't hurt. That's one of the better home records in the whole league. Uh, and that hasn't hurt yeah. them. As you said, that they, there is room for improvement, but how they find those guys that will help advance this team thought I don't know really it's it's difficult so as you said whether or unless they can maybe find a team very near to the cap floor which needs to yeah. pull itself up like Arizona have done in the past where they need the yeah. cap relief uh, you know and I think you know, Girardi could be a serviceable third pair guy for some teams still I'm not saying he's a complete whitewash I just don't see him as a top four D-man on a cup contender that the Rangers yeah. arguably are but uh, let, let's slide across to Brooklyn uh, quickly Pat because the Islanders have had a decent start to the season too they sit third in the Metro just behind the Rangers now on 37 points and it's been a pretty decent start all in all despite the stuff with Hamannick and one that really stands out to me is Carl Poso, who's the joint uh, leader in scoring 22 points in 29 games he's tied with John Tavares there, but there doesn't seem to be any urgency from the Islanders to, to re-sign up post, so I find that really strange. I could see where that would be. I mean, I I know that's where your your loyalty lies too, so <laughs> I understand that as well. Hmm. I understand that too because you know they have put a pretty solid investment into our post. he was a former first round draft pick. Yeah. You know, he's been a seventy, basically almost a seventy point player for them in the past. Mm-hmm. He's basically basically since they put him. With Tavares a couple of years ago, he's been a very good top line right winger for them. You know, on the playoff, uh, he was on a playoff team last year. Eighteen, he had eighteen goals. He's been very good thus far this year. Player Tavares, I don't understand it either, only because, well, for a number of reasons. I understand. Here's what I'll say as far as defending the decision to not necessarily mm-hmm. to not necessarily go out of their way to resign mm-hmm. him. How many wingers has John Tavares played with on Long Island thus far in his career? I mean, name, name the guys: the Matt Moultons, the yeah. PA Parentos, the um, you know. Briefly. Look at what Brock. Look what yeah, Brock Nelson's doing all of a sudden, mm. playing on that top line with them. There's a there has been a revolving door of wingers that have played with Tavares, and the one constant is their production playing with Tavares. <laughs> so if yeah. you don't necessarily want to overpay. To keep Kyle, I mean, I like Kyle Poso as a player. Hmm. He's a hard player. He's a heavy player. He's a big body. He's willing to go to tough areas. Hmm. He could score. He's, he could score on the rush. There's a lot of ways he could score goals. But they have a they have a lot of young players in their system. Yeah, for sure. You know that they're trying to find places for at this point. Hmm. And you know they're they're get they're collecting a lot of money from the Barclays Center to play there. Mm-hmm. But you know, you, you don't. You also, you know, we just talked about Girardi and Stall. You don't want to hamstring yourself by giving a big contract to a guy who you, in your mind, doesn't necessarily deserve it. Now, does this mean that Octoso is not going to get or not worthy of a big time contract? No. Does it mean that? I mean, the Islanders have the cap space to go out and make this move too. You yeah. know, as it yeah, stands yeah, sure. now, there's there's about seven million under the cap. And you look at what the cap projections are for next year. Hmm. There are, you know, they 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 have a you know a pretty substantial amount of cap space there. But you have to also figure in that Franz Nielsen's an unrestricted free agent at the end of the season. So and Franz Nielsen right now is your third leading scorer on the hmm. island, and he's a number two center. So what do you want to do? You want to throw your money at Akposo? You want to throw your money at? Nielsen, you have Casey Tzizekas, who's a restricted. Yeah. You have Strome Matt well. Martin, yeah, who you could go get. You could go make, you know, make maybe make a move and re-sign them to some small money. But you know, these things are. It's not one of those things where you want to give a Poso a long-term big money trade and then, or I'm sorry, big money contract, and then watch Franz Nielsen just walk away, who's arguably the Islanders' most underrated player. 
Oh, so, he, he might be one of the most underrated players in the whole league. I would agree with that, just because, you know, he's, he kills penalties, he's, he's third on the team in scoring, he's their second line, he's a skilled playmaker, he's scoring goals. So, I understand that there's not a lot of urgency, and, and it probably is outraged. It, it, <laughs> it, it, it frustrates fans because, you know, they've seen Akposo grow, they've seen him come through the system, they're finally seeing him start to produce consistently, and now well, we're going to let this guy hit free agency. Yeah. But in the cap age, you know, it's a, it's smart business to be shrewd. Mm. And you have to be shrewd because, you know, you're only, you're only dealt a certain amount of money with which to allocate to players. Yeah. You got, jo- you know, three and a half million dollars almost to Josh Bailey. And you have, you know, five million to, to a third line center, Mikhail Grabowski. And, you know, so these aren't necessarily shrewd decisions. They got Ryan Strom, who was restricted at the end of the year. Mm. Ryan Strom kind of flops nicely on Tavares' right side if a postal walks. So yeah. I understand. I understand the frustration and the outrage, and, and it, coming from a postal as well, because I, I don't think he wants to leave. He's dealt with a lot. You know, he had that that eye injury Ooh, a couple that seasons was last ago. Year, yeah, last year, yeah. Yeah, that he overcame. But you know, they also, you know, if you what you alluded to, you know, if they're if they have to make a deal with Travis Hamannick here. They're gonna. I'm sure they're gonna have to take on some money because um, to get a comp for Travis Hamannick, that cost that, that's gonna cost you. So um, I, I understand. Like I said, I understand the frustration and disappointment maybe from the Exposo camp. I, I appreciate the type of player he is, but um, you know it's it's tough in this cap age. You know, and and you, I would ra- for personally, and you said it too. I'd rather pay the center. Or the two centers, Sezikis and Nielsen, then pay the right winger. Yeah, I mean, I like Sezikis. I, I think, I don't want to say he's wasted on that fourth line because it's a pretty decent fourth line for the Islanders. It gives them a little something different with Martin and, and Clutterbuck down there as well. But as you say, I mean, yeah. Sezikis is 24, he only earns a million dollars this year, so probably a, a pay raise, maybe a small one. Matt Martin's a UFA, could go either way. I think they'll probably try and retain him just because he does bring that big body to the team. Which, yeah, you know, he's a the fan Island, favorite. Yeah, the Islanders don't always have a particularly large amount of grunt in the lineup with guys like Strom, Tavares. They're not those kind of players. So with, with Clutterbuck, it, it is something a little different for this roster. Uh, but even mm-hmm. moving forward, up post is 27, he's probably going to want a reasonable deal and a, a raise on his current $2.8 million yeah. salary. The other thing to consider from the Islanders' point of view, I know others will hit free agency before or in the same year, but John Tavares is a UFA in 2019, which isn't yeah. really that far away. You've got this season and then two more, uh, and he'll be mm-hmm. was he, 27, 28 by then. So he's yeah, still... that'll be his... That's the yeah, UFA year. Yeah, exactly. So that's, the, that's a big payday there that they kind of have to keep half an eye on, especially with... Boychuk and Leddy signed beyond 2019 as well. Uh, as you yeah, said, Ham- yeah. Hamannick's, that's such a brilliant contract, the Hamannick one. It's so hard to, to pull it back the other way. It's, uh, maybe it's just that Okposu thinks he's worth X and the Islanders are only p- willing to pay Y. And as you said, the mm. the way we've seen other players like Matt Molson and, and Thomas Vanek briefly and Perinto is probably the best example, I think. The mm-hmm. way they've improved on Tavares' wing maybe the Islanders are willing to take a chance and say, well, we like what Anders Lee brought last year. We think moving forward, mm-hmm. Anders Lee and Brock Nelson or Anders Lee and Ryan Strom are sufficiently good to play on the wing and give us a, an effective top line. Uh, and as you said, mm-hmm. Franz Nielsen, albeit at 31, is such an underrated player. He can play in any situation. He's so quick on his skates, mm-hmm. great hands. And, you know, and obviously then you've got guys at the back end Zidlicki will move on, well, that will bring Pollock up, I assume, in, in the long run. But you just don't know what you're going to get back in, in for Hamannick. It's a strange one because, as we said, the cap's probably going to go up. They estimate it will be about was it, 74.5 million based on mm-hmm. current projections. So the Islanders aren't hurting for cap space. They'll have around, based on current numbers, they'll have about $9.3 million spare. But that yeah. includes signing these guys and potentially leaving room down the road for other re-signings. It's all a bit of a, a bit of a strange one in, in that sense, and obviously it's complicated by the fact the team's doing quite well now. They're not bona fide cup contenders, but you could consider them being a, maybe a dark horse if Halak got on a hot streak or t- and Tavares, you know, went on a, went on a streak as well. That that 
you know, they could maybe get to a conference final and upset the apple cart a little bit. So mm-hmm. if that's the kind of team you've got, if you're Garth Snow, how do you improve on that? Because you've got to know, um, you've got to now got a solid foundation from which to to go after a cup potentially. Yeah, especially down in the system, you know, they have Del Colley and, and Hosang yeah. as a couple of guys who are still young players and junior, not this year, but for the future, of course. You know, I, I really like what this team is doing this season, especially because there's a lot of turmoil surrounding them in terms, you you know, just from, from the Hamannick thing to the building mm. to their fans are just outraged by this whole move. And the, and the obstructed seats, and you know, he, I don't I don't know. I, you know, Jack Chapuano catches a lot of flack mm. on social media from a variety of different um, groups and Islanders fans and Islanders, you know, reporters. But man, he has been as smooth and calm and and consistent as they come, as in terms of you know keeping his team on the beam. You know, that you look at where you know the Islanders haven't. Well, I mean, the Islanders haven't made the playoffs. In consecutive seasons, I believe since before the lockout, the the full season lockout, it was uh, and Peter Laviolette was the coach then. Yeah, and you know that was kind of a ragtag group then. I mean, this is a much more talented team, but you have to consider that they're you know what they're going through on a daily basis. Most of the guys live on Long Island, and then they they commute to the city for morning skates. It's depending on where they live, it could be an hour. To morning skates, then they're, then they're camped out in a hotel for meetings and for naps and for food, you know, pregame meals and things. Hmm. And then they're going home. So the home games are a long day for these guys. And they have been really good at home yeah. um, this season. They're, they're 10 4 and 2 at home this year. Um, I, I, you know, I think the only team to really beat them consistently at home has been the Bruins for some reason. <laughs> um, I think the Islanders have lost twice at home in regulation to the Bruins. Mm. But against teams that aren't the Bruins, they're 10-2-2 and and at home. So in, in this crazy kind of odd, you know, they're not, they're not getting a lot of fans just because of the configuration of the building. Mm. There's about two, maybe 3,000 obstructed seats in the, in the arena. Yeah, that's crazy. So <laughs> it's, yeah, so, I mean, in the year 2015, it's a, it's a bizarre thing. But, um, you know, I, as as the team is built right now, you know, with Tavares and with, you know, you really don't want to mess, I don't think, too much with it um, as it's built now. I mean, especially since Ryan Strom's kind of picked up his game a little bit since he came back from the American League. Um, you know, I, I don't you – know, Thomas Grice has really been a fantastic mm, dude for that. For sure. Sure. Um, I mean, he's, I mean, both really both goalies have been have been really good. But um, if you look at last season where the Islanders were at, I mean, Halak was playing basically every important game, um, even down the stretch. And I mean, I like Halak as a goaltender. He's he's a he's a nice. I mean, he, he's, he's solid. He's, done, he's, he's a solid stood, starter. On, stood on his head at points to get them to the to get teams to. I mean, he took Montreal to the conference final. Yeah. Well, like five years ago. Yeah. So, um, and and Thomas Grace hasn't played a lot in his career, but now he's proving maybe he's deserving of some some mm. opportunity. So, you know, you talk about how great the Rangers' goaltending has been. The Islanders' goaltending has been pretty fantastic, also. Yeah, yeah. Uh, speaking of great goaltending, let's move to the Devils, who have been a bit of a surprise package this season. Obviously, yeah. everybody knows they've got Corey Schneider back there at least one of the top 10 goalies in the league. Most, a lot of people would have probably put him in their personal top five as well. Mm-hmm. And given that Carey Price and Henrik Lundqvist are automatic selections as two of that top five, that says quite a lot about Corey Schneider's ability. Uh, had a great uh-huh. year last year on a, on a poor, poor Devils team. A lot of people, myself included, didn't expect a lot from New Jersey this year. They got some good kids, but you know, thought it would be a year of pain where it would be about blooding some of these young guys through, but they've turned out pretty good. They've got the first wild card spot at the moment, just about holding off Pittsburgh and Florida. Uh, and their top line has just been absolutely fantastic so far this season. Yeah. If you, and you look at some of the moves the Devils made in the off season, I, I'll be honest. I, I talked with a bunch of people within the organization in the off season. I talked with Ray Shiro, the general manager. I talked with John Hines, the head coach. I talked with some other people inside the organization who, you know, they kind of were playing coy with this team. They said, yeah. you know, well, 
maybe we're not that good. Or, you know, maybe we are building for the future. Or maybe we are kind of rebuilding here. You know, we have this first-year head coach and this rookie guy. And, you know, we, we don't – we're not trying to – you know, we're not trying to – we're not in win-now mode like they were under the, the Lamarillo administration. Yeah. But if you look at how this – how Shiro kind of comprised this team, it's – they are a lot better – than they were last year. And I mean, and that's not saying much when you watch, <laughs> you had to, when you were forced to watch this team on a regular basis last yeah. year. The other thing about it, I would say, is that they are getting some otherworldly performances by some of their forwards. Like, like Adam Henrique is shooting 20% right mm. now, which is incredible. Like, I mean, they are, and they're basically only getting goal scoring from like five guys on their yeah. top two lines. If you look at the, the the breakdown of goals from the Devils, hmm. they have the think, Devils have scored seventy one <laughs> goals this season in twenty eight games. Hmm. Henrique has thirteen, Camilleri has eleven, and Kyle Palmieri has twelve. Yeah. So what's that? Twenty five, thirty six. That's that's more than half of their goals <laughs> from three guys. Hmm. So I mean. I imagine this. The I haven't heard from them much on this topic just because everyone's kind of like, well, everyone's kind of waiting for the sh- other shoot to fall of the Devils here a little bit. Yeah. But I think as the season progresses, you're going to start hearing the comparison to Colorado a couple of years ago. Okay, just because okay, they're... Well, I'd say more so Colorado because mm-hmm. um, Patrick Waugh himself believes that the only reason the Avs made the playoffs two years ago was Barlamov. And right, his yeah, save okay. percentage was fantastic. He was a Vezina Trophy candidate, and they got a lot of really, really great um, offensive performances from. I mean, they had some offensive stars in Colorado too. So don't. Ooh. So it's not like it's out of the question to expect them to score some goals. But the Devils this year, if you look at their advanced numbers, you know everyone's been quick to point out the Rangers' deficiencies in yeah. terms of uh, <laughs> Corsi and Fenwick and and how lucky they've been on PDO. But the Devils' uh, Corsi numbers are bad. They're just not good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. They, they, they've Hell been, bad, yeah. Um, I believe they're in the, the bottom five in terms of Corsi four percentage. So, now this is obviously, you know, you're a goalie, you know, too, mm. that when you're a goaltender, when, you're, when you have a good goaltender, you're always in game. And Schneider is obviously, like you mentioned, he's probably one of the top seven he yeah. might even be a top five goalie in the league. You know, you look at his his numbers since he's come to New Jersey; they've been fantastic. Mm-hmm. And he's and he's really he's in that age. He's only twenty nine, so he's in that age where he's only go, he's not going to you know fall off a cliff. His play's not going to fall off a cliff here in the next you know, or shouldn't in the next three to you know yeah. three years or so. So. There are, the Devils are a young team. They're trying to clear through some of the mistakes of the Lamarillo era. Now, do they have the horses to stay in this race long term? I would say probably not. Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> I also th- yeah, I, I also thought that this was going to, you know, I keep waiting for the five-game losing streak to happen. Mm-hmm. And if you watch this team, what they are, and I listen, I am staunchly against, um, I'm, I'm becoming more and more against the loser point, as they call it. Yeah. But the Devils have been very good at stealing points. I, mm. I believe they have something like six goals this season with their goalie pulled. So um, the Friday night against Philadelphia, they were down, and they scored a goal with a minute left mm. and and tied the game and, and lost in overtime. But they um, they picked up that point, which was important. Last night, or Tuesday in Toronto, they were trailing – and they, you know, Kyle Palmieri scores a goal. And what happens? They get to the shootout and they lose. So I think the, the thing, I mean, the Eastern Conference is, there's a lot of teams with flaws in the Eastern Conference. For sure. And it's becoming per- perfectly obvious that, you know, you like, I like Washington. I like New York, the Rangers. I like the Canadians. Those are the three teams that I really trust. But everybody else, like, you know, who knows, right? Mm. You, know, the, you know, the Red Wings, who knows? You know, their goal differentials plus one. The Senators can't keep pucks out of their own net. 
the Bruins, who knows what their defense is like. You know, can Florida score enough goals? Can the, what is, what's wrong with the Lightning? You know, the Flyers are really not very good. And the Penguins, you know, there's something is amiss there. So are the De- can the Devils stay in that fourth spot in the Metro? Sure, why not, right? <laughs> Everyone else is flawed. So the Devils are, are as flawed as, as anybody else. I, I would expect them to finish. I would still expect them to finish outside the playoffs. But if nothing else, it gives the people here in New Jersey. I mean, there was a lot of kind of, I, for whatever reason, there was hope in mm. the preseason, but it was more hope towards the future. Yeah. And, and that they were ready to punt this season in for next season to kind of get that, you know, that high draft pick so that they could start rebuilding. Mm. And this season's kind of given them like, oh, well, maybe we can compete now. And, and if they don't make the playoffs, then, you know, they still have that draft position to fall back on. So, um, I, I, it's, a, it's a strange, they're a strange team because they really, I, I still don't think they're very good, but, you know, if you look at the players on their team that are performing, they are elite players. Like Adam Henrique's proven he's kind of this budding elite goal scorer. Yeah. And Lee Stamniak's been a nice surprise. Um, you know, went from a, a tryout, now he's their third leading scorer on a team that's in the playoff race. Mm-hmm. And Kyle Palmieri, who's, who never got really the chance to play a lot in Anaheim, now he's got 12 goals in 28 games. Mm-hmm. So I would expect them to drop off, but if nothing else, there, there's, there's, they're at least t- they're hard to play against, I would say. Yeah, uh, I think the other advantage they've got is that Rishi has done a great job in picking up guys like Stempniak, who you describe as a functional NHLer, who are yeah. producing well at the moment. But the thing is, he's on such a great deal. It's a one-year deal, eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars. He, you know, he can still contribute. We can see that, and he's becoming yeah. one of those sort of prototypical guys that get shifted at the deadline. But what Shearer has done is put himself in a position where he can move Lee Stepniak at the deadline or Yuri Kalusti, yep. who he also picked up on a great one-year deal, $800,000. He can move these guys yep. at the deadline if the devils fall away, get some assets mm-hmm. and picks coming back, and then say, okay, we tried, we had a good run at the start of the year, we fell away, let's accumulate picks and look to next season when guys like Stefan Mato, maybe Eric Jelenaus takes on a bit more, uh, they've got, they've got Pavel Zaka coming up as well. So, you know, yeah. they basically have got options. If they hang around, good for them. Maybe they do something and add a guy late if they think they can hold on to a spot. If they fall away, they move guys, collect assets, you know, come back refresh yeah. next year. Because as you said, the way Schneider plays is very conservative, quite compact. I love that about him. And it's one that's not going to be monstrously hard on his body as long as he gets the rest that, that he sometimes needs. And I think Keith Kincaid's kind of shown that he can spell Schneider when required. Yeah, I, I, Kincaid's an okay backup, I would Ooh. say. Um, and I would agree with you. You know, the, I think this year was really more about seeing what the Devils have. And I think they're kind of getting that. But they're also kind of competing here, like you said, just because of a couple of guys um, – who are contributing, you know. So they're seeing that that maybe Travis Zajac is a second-line center. They're seeing that they can play Henrique at center and that he can produce there. And, um, and you know, they're seeing that, you know, what they have in, in guys like – and I agree with you with Stemniak because it, what's really interesting with me is how bad a year he had last year. And it really was kind of a year plus because they the Penguins traded for him Hmm. I, I believe it was the trade deadline of 2014. It would have been, yeah. And they played. They put him up there when it came to, when Pascal Dupuis kind of went down, hmm. um, and he didn't do a whole lot in Pittsburgh. Um, he no. was really, you know, 11 points he had, and he didn't score enough goals. And they went out, and it was a big mistake. So the Rangers <laughs> picked him up last year, and they were trying to play him in a bottom six role, and he's really not a bottom six player. Um, which is straight, which is not, it's not good based on his, his mm. career point totals, but he's really more of like a second line right winger. At this, and, and to be fair here too, he's having something of a resurgent season this season because he hadn't topped, he hasn't topped 30 points since, in, well, I guess, I guess he, he, uh, he hasn't topped 30 points in any full season since for one team in, 2012-13, and now he's on pace for something like 60 points. 
Yeah. Um, which, again, speaks to the kind of luck the Devils have had so far. But, I mean, you look, Stemniak wants to play kind of that more offensive game, and the Rangers were kind of hampering that because he was a third, kind of a third and fourth line player in and out of the lineup. And then, you know, he gets traded to Winnipeg last year and, you know, had it, had it okay. You know, he was a, he had a good close to that season, but, you know, it's, the Devils signed him. And like you said, kind of like, well, what's a spare part? Let's see what he has. Hmm. A PTO type deal. And he, he earned a contract, which is good. And, um, and I agree with you that if, you know, if you look at a team, maybe in the Western Conference, because he played a, the bulk of his career in the Western Conference. Yeah. If you look at, at a, you know, for a guy who, if, if a team needs to pick up a top nine or a top two right wing, uh, I don't know. I mean, if there's an injury, perhaps, you know, in, in certain spots, the Devils could be in a position to, to offload it um, if they're out of the race. So I, I agree with you that it was a, a good decision to pick him up. He's been better than they could have even dreamed. And uh, and if he gets them, you know, a pick down the road or, or a prospect or somebody, then that's, you know, you, you say that was a good decision. Um, and then, like you said, that's kind of the, the decisions that that were not happening in under Lamarillo in previous years. You look at last season where they had, you know, all these guys that were, you know, a hodgepodge thrown together of, of players. They had Yager who fetched them a pick and Zidlischke who fed, fetched them a pick, but there were a lot of rental type players that other teams didn't want any part of, you know, Scott Gomez mm. and Steve Bernier's name keeps, keeps coming mm. up. Um, you know, in that top six role. I mean, the thing is, at least, you know, guys like Stemniak and guys like Toulouse, I mean, Toulouse hasn't done much, but those types of guys have produced at yeah. this point to kind of enhance their value, whereas if they need to go out, and the Devils need to go out, and if they fall out of this and, need, and, and want to trade a guy like Stemniak, then, I mean, then there's, you know, there's no harm there. But they, they do have a pretty good nu- nucleus, uh, a young nucleus. I mean, Camilleri, I think, is he's in his mid thirties. Hmm. But you know, you look at Henrique's yeah, yeah. young, Palmieri's young. They have a core of young defensemen that are there. Um, so I, I would. This has been a pretty. Uh, I, I would say I'm sure it'd be a a uh, satisfying season so far for Shiro and for the Devil. Yeah, for sure. Uh, thank you very much for joining me today, Pat. It's been great to have you on once again. Uh, where can people find you online and find your work? Well, I've been doing work for the Times, for the New York Times, um, mostly covering the Rangers and some other um, some other um, any, uh, national NHL stuff. I, I've been doing some work for the AP. I've been covering the Islanders mostly for the uh, Associated Press. <laughs> so um, there's been some of that, and then um, a little bit here and there for NHL.com. And uh, and as always, you can find if you're interested in my opinions and things on Twitter at Pat underscore Pickens. Perfect. Thanks again, Pat. Take care of your speech. I'll speak to you again very soon. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate it. One Puck Short is brought to you in association with Eastside Hockey Manager, an in-depth ice hockey management simulation brought to you by Sports Interactive and Sega, developers of the world-famous Football Manager series, available now for PC via Steam. Well, there we are. Thanks again to Pat Pickens for joining me on this week's show. It's great to catch up with Pat and talk a, a little New York hockey. He's uh, so clued into the things that are going on around Madison Square Garden, the Barclays Centre, and in New Jersey as well. Uh, as he said, you could follow him on Twitter, at Pat underscore Pickens. OK, we've reached the end of this week's show. Just one final thing to get to on the agenda. It's your chance to win a copy of Eastside Hockey Manager, courtesy of the guys at Sega. Simple, really. I want an answer to this question. Who are the highest scoring brothers in NHL history? So which brothers scored the most amount of points combined in NHL history? Simple as that. Email your answers to onepuckshaw at gmail.com and a winner will be chosen ahead of next Wednesday's show. That's Wednesday the 16th. Just a couple of little housekeeping bits and pieces. Uh, thank you very much to Tony Heisman who sent in a little donation to the show very much appreciated tony thank you uh, if you would like to donate to one Puck short to help with the upkeep of the site and the blog there's a paypal donation link on the website one puckshort.wordpress.com there's also an amazon affiliate link just on the right hand side just below the paypal link basically use that link 
get all your Christmas shopping done through Amazon. It doesn't cost you any more, but we get a little bit of a kickback from everything you buy. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Rob McGregor 35. You can find us and like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash one puck short. And as I said, you can email us one puck short at gmail.com. Good luck to all of those entering the competition and I'll speak to you all again very soon.